Um, last time we started the first half of the MDMA and MDMA-like substances lecture. Today we are going to finish that lecture and possibly be able to have time to start on stimulants. So let's do it. Okay, so last when we left off, we were looking into the more whoops therapeutic psychological side of things right i don't know if you guys remember this guy who was talking about how ptsd treatment with mdma is just like remarkably successful and is currently having about a 60 to 70 percent success rate in these clinical trials in conjunction with psychotherapy which is about three times as effective as existing ptsd treatments so we looked kind of into that side of things the more medicalized side of things but now i want to take a little detour into how exactly mdma works and full disclosure, actually just today I realized that I was supposed to go through and rework some of these slides that contain an outdated theory on MDMA. And so please bear with me, I'm going to walk through the things that I couldn't get around to finishing. There are some bits that are a little bit incongruent. I'm gonna to have to go back in and fix them. Um, so for the time being, I'm sorry, I, that was totally my fault. I forgot that that was on my to-do list. So real quick, let's just talk about how Molly works, because I think this is a really big, it's really dark in here, stupid. I think this is a really big point of confusion for a lot of people is how exactly MDMA works and how it's different from psychedelics. Now, if we remember, classical psychedelics will stick themselves into a serotonin receptor and often pull its um, receptor over its head like a blanket and just hang out there. And it's not dumping serotonin necessarily, but kind of like tweaking the way that serotonin binds, which is an unusual thing. With Molly, on the other hand, this is a dumper. This is the kind of drug that will, we'll just walk through how it happens basically. But the gist of it is that Molly dumps serotonin into the synapse, which means that you are just getting that sensation of serotonin over and over and over and over and over again, like repeatedly for a period of time. Obviously, this isn't that sustainable because you have a limited reserve of serotonin in your brain and MDMA really dumps it. Depending on the dose that you're doing, you could dump part of it or most of it or all of it. And if I remember correctly, serotonin is the scarcest neurotransmitter in the brain. Don't quote me on that, but I feel pretty sure that that's the case. Um, and to a smaller extent, it's going to have a little bit of a dumping effect on dopamine and norepinephrine. So just from that, we can kind of get an image of what this drug might do. Remember, the serotonin is responsible for pleasure and mood and affect um, and sleeping and feeding cycles, so you're probably not going to be able to eat very easily on this one. Um, also, that serotonergic drugs cause jaw clenching and tooth grinding, so that's a big part of why this happens with MDMA is the serotonin aspect of things as well as the norepinephrine aspect of things and the dopamine aspect of things. It is a stimulant, but Molly's not a stimulant like other stimulants are, right? Like for those of you here who have rolled before, you probably would know that if you have real MDMA, you're not like, oh, I gotta go. <laughs> you're not up and dancing. In fact, a lot of people can't even get their fucking ass off the floor. Hence the word floored that we talked about last time. Just ravers living in the moment, no phones in sight, just floored. So when we see this dumping mechanism, what, what basically is happening, right, is that we just introduce MDMA into the system and it floods the synapse. There's a shitload of serotonin, it's a field day. And it blocks the reuptake transporter at the same time, so all of these little sun boys are just hanging out and mingling indefinitely basically or until the effects of mdma wears off because eventually your brain's going to come in and play cleanup and be like okay party's over like you had your fun and also we're out of serotonin there's nothing else you can't take anything more from us so let's get more scientific with this let's look at exactly how this works right um raise your hand if you're afraid of this diagram this is fake i'm comfortable with this diagram now but i wasn't at first so I want to just like go into this the real nitty-gritty right so we have the presynaptic terminal here right these are on the um this is the axon terminal we have the dendrite down here with the receptors on it it's just a different abstraction of the same concept we talked about right we have neurotransmitters which are these squares we have reuptake transporters which are these arrows um we have receptors and you can see the firing activity right so MDMA does its thing by being sneaky, sneaky swiper, right? We have MDMA that, that looks just like serotonin would. So your brain is like, oh ho, we have a friend in town. 
it's not friend, it's MDMA, or it could be friend, depending on how you think about it. But you have this intruder, basically, in your brain, that's maybe like a biased way of putting it, not actually an intruder, but you have this chemical that is disguising itself effectively as serotonin. So it goes in, it gets sucked up through the transporter. It's like, how do you do fellow kids? And then it's inside of your presynaptic axon. And there it just goes around and pops all the bubbles. It's like, okay, everyone's free, like recess. Let's, let's do it. Let's storm the gates. And from there, MDMA goes and switches the, oh yeah, that's right. I, I misspoke. It's not actually a, a reuptake inhibitor. It actually switches the direction of the transporters entirely. So instead of having a vacuum that's pulling all of this stuff into here, we flip that vacuum upside down. It's like, like pulling all of the serotonin into the synapse. It's just this massive process of like free for all, basically. So MDMA disguises itself as serotonin, gets sucked up through the transporter. Once it's like, I'm in, then it pops all these bubbles, releases the neurotransmitters, the serotonin, and then flips these transporters and sucks the neurotransmitters into the synapse. So it's just a huge party, honestly, party in your melon. So we have the synapse and it's full of serotonin now. And this means that as soon as the serotonin pops out of the receptor, another molecule will pop in. So it's just this rapid fire sensation of affect and pleasure and emo emotional availability. And that's how Molly does its thing, right? Now, after you've done this, um, you're not going to have much left. You've just basically dumped, I mean, you've, you've literally dumped your serotonin due to swipe or no swiping, getting in there and popping your bubbles and flipping your vacuum and whatever other shitty analogy I'm going to use to describe this. So it's true that you do get the sensation a lot of the time, not all of the time, of irritability and sadness in the coming days after rolling. Now, this impacts people with different levels. It's not necessarily the case that everyone is going to take Molly and then the next few days just feel really depressed. If you are prone to major depressive episodes, you're probably more at risk of having a harder time after you roll. The larger your dose, the harder your, your post roll is gonna be. If you redose multiple times, the harder your post roll is gonna be. If you're dosing too frequently, if you're combining with other drugs, if you're not taking care of your physiological needs, these are all things that will influence this. And honestly, at the end of the day, some people are just more prone to Tuesday blues than others. That's what we call it. I mentioned this last time is Tuesday blues, right? It's a couple of days after you roll and things just aren't as sparkly. You have a harder time gleaning joy from things, gleaning satisfaction from people. You feel maybe more restless, maybe more antsy, maybe a little harder time sleeping. It's really hot in my room right now. I can't even see me sweating. Um, so this is something that does vary from person to person. And a lot of people have been like, well, Rachel, like, am I going to just feel like garbage for the next week? And the answer is, I don't know, <laughs> probably not. Realistically, you'll probably be just fine as long as you take a reasonable quantity of MDMA that's proportional to your body weight. And we'll talk about how to identify that in a little bit. Um, and also you're not rolling too frequently because I guarantee the more frequently you roll, the more you're gonna feel this bar none. And it does get to the point where it, for a lot of people, it's just not worth it anymore because it's not so much that you're like, oh, I'm fucking angry all the time. It's more like you like close the fridge door and it doesn't close all the way. Normally you'd be like, oh, but instead you're like, oh, fuck, like stuff like that. It's like things are just amplified and your reactivity is amplified, but it does go away. It's chemical. It does go away. Now here is the major bathe me in this flamey orange light. Here is a major question here. Um, the question is, is there a dangerous interaction with SSRIs or where does the swiper stop swiping from good or bad? Um, we'll talk actually specifically about the interaction with SSRIs in a couple minutes. So neurotoxicity is a hot button issue with MDMA. This is the whole scientific community is just like so hot for this topic right now, at least those that do drug research. And there are quite a few very biased studies about this that you can tell when you start reading them in the abstract, it'll be like this highly dangerous drug of abuse that people don't understand the deleterious impacts of. And you can tell pretty much immediately that even if it's a scientific journal, the people that did this study did it with the intention of finding something negative. So you wanna look for really neutral language in studies when you're looking for stuff like this. Just be aware of that in advance for all drugs. Um, neurotoxicity is damage to your neurons, right? So when we say neurotoxicity, this doesn't necessarily mean that your brain cells die. That's a very generalized term. Remember that the, a brain cell consists of the axon, which is that Putin body, 
it's like the, the rubber cord that has rubber insulation, it, it carries a signal. And then you have the um, dendrites up at the top and the axon terminals down at the bottom. So when you're talking about damage to a neuron, it could be any part of that. So pop quiz, if you damage the axon of a neuron, what might happen to the signal? What might happen as a result of that? If you damage an axon, any thoughts? Think about what an axon looks like, first of all. And then think about what its job is. Have I ever mentioned that I hate Zoom? I see the signal disperses and goes somewhere else or fails to fire altogether. That is very much on the right track. So if you have the axon is basically the rubber cord that you use to plug in your computer. And if you damage that cord, the signal won't get through as effectively. So when we're talking about MDMA neurotoxicity, the thing that might be damaged is the axon, which means that your serotonin neurons aren't dead. The brains are still alive in those neurons. It's just that they're not going to be as effective at transporting signals. And in many cases, that can be regenerated over time, but we'll come back to that in a second. So big question is MDMA neurotoxic? And the answer is, it can be, but only under certain circumstances. Doing casual recreational doses of MDMA on occasion are not likely to induce significant neurotoxicity, if any. Um, however, this is all very subjective and relative, right? So if you're taking Molly too frequently, if you're consuming it in large quantities, if you're consuming it in a hot environment, and this is the single biggest danger of rolling actually, is, is rolling in a hot environment. And well, I'll tell you exactly why. This is part of the reason that it's such a travesty that so many clubs and venues don't allow cool down spaces, don't offer free water, because overheating is what cooks people and sends them to the ER. It's this specifically. Um, and also consuming with other drugs might influence neurotoxicity. I'll talk about why. So this is the first in a series of slides that I was supposed to redo and only kind of did. So we'll go a little bit slow through these, right? So the major theory that we have about how MDMA could be neurotoxic is that generally speaking, and actually this, we're gonna ignore MAO for now. Generally speaking, you have systems inside of your brain that will go through and clean up things that are potentially damaging to your neurons, basically. Um, so here's a neuron, for example. So we have serotonin in the synapse. We have reuptake transporters that are ready to suck it back up inside. Now, usually something like MAO or something comparable would break down the metabolites of MDMA into what are known as free radicals, basically. Free radicals are these chemicals that have the potential to get inside of your neurons if they're not cleaned up and cause what's called oxidative stress. It's a little bit like rusting almost inside of your neurons. So there's a reason that people take antioxidants. The whole idea behind antioxidants is that your brain is already equipped with antioxidants. They go through and they gobble up these metabolites and get rid of them. So let me just recap this real quick idea is when MDMA gets broken down in your body, particularly in your liver, it has metabolites. So usually it gets broken down into these little separate pieces. And then from there, antioxidants will come in and gobble up those even smaller pieces until they're gone. However, um, the National Institute for Drug Abuse studies are loaded with inherent bias, but their data is valuable. I have a lot to say about publication bias. And if we have time at the end of this, I will come back to that comment. Um, yes, so this is, this, is, this is not an updated slide. Pretend that this is just a free radical. This is a skull and crossbones, right? So normally you have antioxidants, um, enzymes that break down. Previously I said hydrogen peroxide in here because there was another theory about dopamine getting broken down into hydrogen peroxide, but that has been um, largely dismissed by the scientific community. So we're swapping this out for the fact that MDMA gets broken down in your body into these smaller pieces that are supposed to get broken down by antioxidants in your brain. Now, the problem here is that in too high of internal temperatures, 
enzymes like antioxidants can't do their jobs. So you're left with these broken down pieces of MDMA that are free radicals that could damage the inside of neurons and antioxidants aren't around to clean them up basically. Or the oxidant, antioxidants are around but they're overloaded or they're overwhelmed. Does anyone have questions on this so far? One more time, just is MDMA gets broken down into smaller free radicals. And usually antioxidants would come around and like eat them up. But in high internal temperatures, antioxidants are not as effective at doing their jobs. And your brain might be overwhelmed by the number of free radicals that it needs to clean up. And this is the basis that we think Neuro, as of right now, to my knowledge, this is the current understanding of how neurotoxicity likely works, is that these toxin metabolites, these byproducts of MDMA, somehow go unchecked. And you can probably imagine how doing higher quantities of MDMA would likely increase this risk somewhat because you have more free radicals to deal with, that having a higher internal body temperature would increase this risk somewhat because you have fewer antioxidants at your disposal. And also that doing this too frequently could pose difficulty for other reasons that we'll talk about in a, in a little bit. Now, this is just looking at MAOs. And the question about SSRIs is a really good one. But I want to point out, also, I know it looks kind of like I like baby puked on my shirt, but it's just bleach. I found this in a box somewhere. Um, MAOs are another class of antidepressants, right? And when we talk about interactions with MDMA, the number one most dangerous interaction with MDMA, okay, there are probably several, but one of the most dangerous interactions with MDMA is not actually SSRIs, but MAOs. And the reason for that is that MAO usually goes around, monoamine oxidase, goes around and smashes up extra neurotransmitters in your brain. It's like the cleanup crew. It goes around and is like, beep, beep, like ready to go. Um, if you have an MAOI, an inhibitor of this process, then you're not breaking down this additional serotonin. So you just have a bunch of it. So if you're rolling and you have an MAOI in your system, then there's not going to be that regulatory cleanup crew that comes in and like gets the serotonin out of there. Now, does anyone know what that might lead to? Anyone already familiar with this? I bet that some of you are. Serotonin syndrome. Exactly, serotonin syndrome. So this is a really big issue. And not that many people are in MAOs, but a lot of people don't realize that MAOs and SSRIs have very different interactions with MDMA. If you are event staff, for instance, or if you come across someone that is like dripping sweat and freaking out, um, you might be well, uh, let me start that sentence over. It's a really good idea to ask someone first and foremost, are you on any medications? There are almost always interactions with medications, even on a small scale. Serotonin syndrome is a condition where your body is overwhelmed with serotonin, as you might be able to imagine. The biggest danger here is overheating, and then after that, going into shock. If someone starts becoming agitated, if they start sweating excessively, um, if they're going into shock and becoming less responsive, these are all indicators excuse me, a potential serotonin syndrome, but a really, really big one that happens when someone is really at risk here because serotonin syndrome usually is not life-threatening unless it's with something like an MAOI. You can have minor serotonin syndrome from other drugs, but an MAOI is very, very high risk for very bad serotonin syndrome, um, is muscle rigidity. If someone starts stiffening like this, or if their hands start curling, this might be an indicator of serotonin syndrome that is very serious, so keep an eye out for that. Now, going back to the kind of the neurosciencey bit here, and at a later date, we'll go more into how to recognize serotonin syndrome and what to do about it, if you see it, um, is this concept called receptor down regulation. Now, what this means, and this is, again, another abstracted form of what a neurotransmitter looks like because the science is crazy. <laughs> What this means is that, assume all these little red things are receptors, right? We have our postsynaptic neuron and we have receptors that are sticking out of them. So all these red things are the receptors. Over time, if there are, if there's just like a ton of serotonin, for instance, or if there's a ton of a neurotransmitter in the synapse, and so it's like binding continuously like crazy with all these receptors, your body's gonna be like, whoa, 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 whoa. This is like, we need to regulate this. We're getting too much of this neurotransmitter's effect. So we're gonna suck these boys back in so that there are fewer receptors to bind at. So that means that assuming that you have like 
a one-to-one -one ratio or a two-to-one ratio of serotonin to serotonin receptors, that'd be a really continuous binding, right? And you don't need that. That's not biologically advantageous. So if you have that excessive availability of a neurotransmitter, your body in response might suck the neurotransmitter receptors back into the membrane and be like, we're just going to like hold on to these for a minute because that way it'll become like a five to one ratio. So there's more competition for that binding. So it's not happening quite as frequently. Now, the reason this is relevant for MDMA is that if you're rolling really often and you do have to roll really often for receptor downregulation to happen, I think it would have to be like within days or like two weeks max or something like that, um, receptor downregulation can happen. And the problem with this is that once you're not rolling anymore and your brain is releasing a normal amount of serotonin, suddenly you have fewer receptors to deal with. So previously you'd had like a five to one ratio of neurotransmitter to receptor, and then you stop rolling and you have a one to one ratio, but fewer receptors to bind at. And now your brain is just like not getting enough of the serotonin action. Does this kind of make sense a little bit? Does anyone need clarification on that? So, TLDR. Oh, go so, for it. So you said, down regulation can occur if you roll frequently with frequently, the edge of frequently being like multiple days within a two week uh, time frame. Very loosely defined, yes. It's, we don't have a lot of very concrete information on how down regulation occurs. It's just another piece to the puzzle to be aware of. To my knowledge, long-term regula down regulation will only happen if you're rolling super consistently in a short time frame, because that way your brain is basically trying to protect itself by, by compensating in reverse. It's like, oh fuck, I just keep getting hit with these waves of excessive amounts of serotonin. So I have to kind of like rein this in a little bit. Otherwise my system's just going to be going haywire all the time. And it's not going to reach homeostasis. Does that so make sense? Theoretically two nights in a row at once per month would be okay-ish for a, for a long term. We'll get to the spacing in a little bit because spacing is the most contentious part of MDMA, I would say. And the thing that most people, in my opinion, get wildly wrong and put themselves really at risk for. But it's, again, it's, it's really, we don't have enough research on this to have like concrete numbers. Um, the thing with receptor downregulation, and I'll, I'll address that specific question when we get back to that point. The thing with receptor downregulation is that in the long term, it is possible that you will just, generally speaking, get less serotonin feeling if you're rolling too often. In your life, you will get less serotonin feeling. Can this be reversed through time? Yeah, it can be, but it requires a period of abstinence, right? What about building a tolerance? I thought the more you use, the more receptors you get, and the more MDMA you need to feel the same effect. Um, it's not quite that simple. So... Again, this, this all kind of has to do with not only how often you're rolling, but how much you're rolling on. And I'm actually going to get through a little more of this and then come back to both of those questions because those are both really good questions. But I want to get a little more groundwork on before we talk about them. So when we're looking at the quantity of MDMA that you're using, um, this is just like arbitrary definition stage one, two, three that I've created. This is not like an official metric. But... If you have a quote unquote normal roll, you have a roll that's within a reasonable range of milligrams and you're not redosing excessively and you haven't been rolling super frequently, then you're going to release a lot of your serotonin, but not all of it. Um, you're not going to have any receptor downregulation and you're not going to necessarily experience a notable crash. You might feel a little bit less the next day or the next couple of days. It can take like five days to really start to get back to baseline for some people. Um, but it's not going to like be super debilitating usually. Stage two, whatever that means, is a heavy roll. Like you're using a large quantity of MDMA. Um, like I would say that you start getting in the heavy roll range between at like 150 or 160 milligrams and above. That's a heavy roll. And most people do not need more than 125 milligrams to roll. Some people rarely need 180 when they're naive. That's like the max, though, usually. Um, and those people are usually really naturally tolerant to a lot of drugs. But the vast majority of people don't need more than 125. So if you're taking two quad stacks in a night, and you're ever doing it, it's not necessary. And you've probably developed a tolerance. Um, 
if you roll on a heavy dose, then you're probably going to release like quite a lot of your serotonin, if not all of it. You might experience some receptor downregulation in the following days, which is part of what causes this crash, is this, this downregulation, um, and there might be a recovery period. And then stage three, arbitrary term, is like you really, really fucking overdid it. You went ham and might have taken like 400 milligrams in a night. And I'm sure actually that for some of you in here, you'd be like, is 400 milligrams a lot? Yes, 400 milligrams is a very large quantity of molly. And if you need that much to roll, then you have, you have put yourself in a position of abusing it, honestly, because, and I use the word abuse only in the terms of like, you've put yourself in a place of needing more to get the same effect. Um, like this is not a, a virtue signaling. So if you've been rolling on excessively high amounts, then you're going to have notable downregulation in the coming days or weeks. You're going to have few, like less capability of producing that serotonin feeling um, and have like a notable crash usually. And this could last for several weeks, depending on how hard you roll. Let's put it all together. Um, we say, how many milligrams are typical in a single point? A point by definition is 100 milligrams. However, you're going to really have to have a milligram scale if you want to weigh, to weigh this appropriately and know how much you truly have in there because dealers could put anywhere from like 40 milligrams to 120 and like not even know. Yeah, so 0.1 gram is a point. Thank you, Shark. Um, okay, so MDMA enters the neuron disguised as serotonin. Swiper no swiping gets up in there. Um, pops all the bubbles that contain serotonin and then they switch the transporters around so the vacuums are sucking serotonin out into the synapse. So we have this double whammy of like all the serotonin is getting released from its bubble jails and getting pulled into the synapse at the same time. Um, it's getting moved in there by the transporters. Then after a while, the transporters get reversed once MDMA is kind of like kicked out by the bouncers. It starts getting cleaned up by MAO, which again, remember that's a problem. Um, if you don't have MAO to clean it up, then it's just like the serotonin keeps binding and MDMA just like sticks around for too long, basically. Um, a lot of the serotonin in the synapse will get sucked back in or destroyed because it's no longer needed. But some of the toxic metabolites from MDMA, and this is an old symbol, ignore that please. Some of the toxic metabolites from MDMA might also get sucked up basically in this process. Um, I wish I had more on these slides about that. And then from there, we have this whole thing about how high internal body temperatures or antioxidants can't break down these toxic metabolites further, and there's free radicals, and that could cause effective rusting inside of your axons of your neurons and basically put them temporarily out of service. And this could happen at varying degrees, you know, to varying degrees, I'm sorry, and to varying levels of severity. So it's kind of circumstantial there. Um, your brain is going to have far less serotonin available. Oh my God, I just noticed that I deleted number five and just didn't even bother renumbering these. Um, you're not going to have as much serotonin to work with for a while. It's part of why you feel like shit or feel less than normal. And then over the course of the next few weeks, your serotonin levels will reach their normal peak again. And over the, I would say that after like approximately a month, you'll have full levels again. Let's bust some myths. So does MDMA punch holes in your brain? These images were popularized by Oprah. These are actually not related to MDMA whatsoever. I'm not sure how this ended up happening. Um, these were like a CT scan of blood flow to certain areas of the brain. Um, seems like a long recovery for one night of rolling. I'll go more into the process of like identifying roll dosages and recovery times when we get to that point because that's something that I want to be able to really have discourse on and I want to get through the rest of this today. Um, right, myth busted. These, MDMA does, does not punch holes in your brain. It does not do that, period. Like, that just, this would not happen. Now, this is possibly my favorite scandal in all of drug history. This shit is fully crazy. Like, unbelievable. So this guy, Dr. George Ricard, say boo, um, released a study in 2001 in Science Magazine that was like, you guys, I just did this study and I gave MDMA to these monkeys and it fucking wrecked their dopamine system and their brains. Like, it's fried, it's destroyed. Like, you, you're, not, you're not gonna believe this, you guys, like locker talk. And this rocked the scientific community because until then, there'd been nothing like this out there to indicate that something like this was the case. Um, it turns out though, 
that Dr. George Ricard, you're not, you're literally not going to believe me when I say this. Dr. George Ricard came out with a statement a few months later being like, oh shit, I think I accidentally used meth, not Molly. <laughs> this is a true story, like dead ass. This happens to be a government contracted researcher who has been paid $10 million or so to research MDMA even after this happened and who is one of the only researchers who consistently puts out like thoroughly negative studies about MDMA. Correlation is not equal causation, but it's really interesting, right? Like how could you get away with a scandal this hefty? And the worst part is he didn't even come out of this on his own accord. He actually was pressured by someone that reviewed his results and was like, uh, are you sure about this? And then, yeah, what the actual fuck is right. And then he was like, oh shit, I mixed up the vials. I used methamphetamine on these monkeys. Like, oh, oops. Like, how, how the fuck do you get away with that? Isn't that like, tell me that's not the craziest shit you've ever heard. Wag of the finger. Yeah, that's right. Um, bust that myth. The problem with this is that we still see this being used um, and cited by people. So this is a $1.3 million experiment, and this really fucked things up for MDMA research. And this was actually, I think, one of the major studies that was cited by Joe Biden when he wrote the Rave Act. This was the study that pushed MDMA into the spotlight as being this like incredibly damaging, dangerous, neurotoxic substance and freaked everyone out because it had previously been like flying high under the radar. That was a bad description. So this guy just like continues raking it in. And unfortunately, even today, there are psychiatrists, psychologists, drug researchers, parents, whatever, who will cite this study as being like MDMA causes Parkinson's. Because what is Parkinson's? It's a disease of dopamine neurons. Remember, it's a motor control issue. And that's why stimulants like methamphetamine, when administered at chronic doses, can induce Parkinson's-like symptoms. But now the medical community is still citing this study as being evidence that Molly can induce Parkinson-like symptoms. And what's even more maddening about this is that since MDMA is methylene dioxy methamphetamine, people that don't really know a lot about drugs can pull that and be like, oh yeah, it has meth in it and meth destroys dopamine neurons. And that's just not the case. They're simply very different drugs. So if you ever see um, studies that cite things about MDMA and Parkinsonism, this is not, or this is not like the actual Ricard study that's being cited here, but like this study draws on elements from that. So here's another Dr. Ricard study my absolute favorite researcher ever. So a lot of people are asking like, okay, does MDMA destroy your serotonin neurons? The, the short answer here is no, it does not destroy your serotonin neurons. But the longer answer is that it can destroy the axons if administered in certain ways, um, but not the cell bodies, not the brains. And that's important because the brains are what dictate how a cell regenerates itself, right? So it's a very different story to kill the entire neuron slash the cell body than to just kill like some of the fingers or the legs, basically, because those can potentially be grown back. Um, if you do damage serotonin axons by doing MDMA, you can see here, this was a study where this, this control thing is showing the, whoops, showing the presence of, I believe serotonin, I think these are just like the neurons themselves, actually. This is the control, so this is what this monkey starts out having. This is two weeks after ecstasy, right? So this is basically like, wow, oh, Jesus, like there is no serotonin neurons that are left functioning. Oh my God, this monkey must be thinking a lot about Sufjan Stevens right now. And then seven years after ecstasy, MDMA, you've seen that some of them have grown back. Now you might look at this and be like, Studies like these over, use overdose months of MDMA. Exactly, we'll get to that in a second. This is why it's really important to not just look at a study and cite it for your purposes. You have to read the whole thing and you have to cross-reference its um, authors and see where they work and see what they've been funded by. It's very important to research your research. So you might look at something like this and be like, oh Jesus, like that's very clear evidence that if you do Molly, then two weeks after you use it, your serotonin neurons are not gonna be working. And then even seven years later, you haven't recovered. But then you actually look at the fine print of what this study did. 
an average dose of MDMA is 1.5 milligrams per kilogram in one night. So for someone like me, that would be like approximately 85 milligrams of MDMA. And realistically, people do more than that, you know, but it's still not a It's 10 milligrams per kilogram, four days straight, twice a day. Why would you do this if you're looking to replicate the effects of recreational use in humans? Like, what is the purpose of doing a study like this and not doing another study that replicates human use? Except for, like, there is a reason that this was done, right? Like, there's a reason that this is best week of that monkey's life. <laughs> You know, I gotta be honest, I feel like receptor down regulation would not make that the case with this one. But 10 milligrams per kilogram, four days straight, twice a day. Let's do some quick math there. So that's approximately, that's more than five times a standard dose of MDMA. So for instance, that would be like 500 milligrams of Molly twice a day for four days straight. And even so, um, this was in monkeys actually. So this was like a totally different ratio as well. This isn't even comparable to a human dose because it's monkey brains. Like you need less for monkey brains. This is like, what, 60, 70 times what a, what a human would do? That was just like spitball math. I don't know how to do math. I can't count. Thanks, Dr. Ricard. We love this guy. So th the other interesting thing that I want to point out here is that even when we are ODing the fuck out of these monkeys on Molly, even after we've put them through what could be a potentially fatally large quantity of MDMA, their serotonin axons still grow back. And honestly, you have to admit that that's kind of impressive. Like, this is something that should have caused massive damage. Um, smaller animals metabolize drugs faster than humans. I don't know for monkeys, but rodents need about 12 times a dose for a human equivalent. Yes, exactly. So this is like an enormous quantity of MDMA. And because of this, this is a really interesting thing that we're seeing actually, is that even when you od OD'd the fuck out of these monkeys, their neurons grow back or their axons grow back, but they grow back at different angles in different places. And we don't know quite what that means yet. So that is an interesting thing that we should look at. We don't really know exactly. But yeah, you're not going to have your serotonin neurons destroyed by doing MDMA on a casual recreational basis. There might be other consequences though, for sure. So in terms of recovering serotonin, the purple bar is people that don't use drugs, the, the whatever that color is, the turquoise bar is former people that use MDMA, and the yellow is people that currently use MDMA. Now, what this means is serotonin transporter densities. This is the number of vacuums that are responsible for sucking serotonin back into the synapse. Now, if you have a lower transporter density, that's an indicator that your serotonin neurons have been put through the ringer, basically. However, former ecstasy users have approximately the same density as non-drug users altogether. And this is just like, oh, I forgot to close that. This is just one example of how like abstinence from this drug, your brain just kind of like recovers most of the time. Not all the time is not set in stone, but this is just something that's very overinflated as being an issue. Um, this is just like a metric for approximately how quickly you'll recover your serotonin after rolling. Generally speaking, um, within a couple of days or like within a week, you've mostly reached baseline again. Within three weeks, you have almost entirely reached baseline, and within a month, you've reached baseline, approximately. Now, in terms of deaths, on very rare occasions, people die from just MDMA. And the reason for that is pretty much always just like heart complications, like a person with a heart condition, right? And you put a stimulant in the system, and um, it is true that there are serotonin neurons in your heart, or serotonin neurons, serotonin receptors in your heart. And that's actually something interesting that we'll, we'll talk about later is that actually there's a, a possibility that, that LSD is cardiotoxic, toxic to your heart when used too frequently because you have those serotonin receptors in your heart. We'll come back to that. That's new research. Um, and then there are possibly complication deaths, which is often from combining things and getting serotonin syndrome. Um, not drinking enough water is a really huge one. And heat stroke, overheating. Overheating is the number one biggest danger of rolling. I cannot stress this enough. Don't roll in a hot tub. I know you want to. I'm looking at you. Don't roll in a hot tub. I know it's tempting. Don't do it. Now, 
there's a like a very low possibility of becoming physically dependent on MDMA, you know, like that you would have to really, 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 really overdo it with Molly to even approach that territory. On a psychological level though, it is possible to become psychologically dependent on it because of how much of an open heart bomb it is. So a lot of people start using it when they go to raves or parties. And then in some cases it can start to become something where they're like, well, I'm going to this party and I feel like a rebound of social anxiety if I don't have this like social lubricant, basically. It's not like a massive potential for this to happen, but I'm not gonna say it's impossible. In terms of addiction, there's a low, slightly lower or slightly higher than like fully low chance of developing an addiction to MDMA, but it is very uncommon, like truly quite uncommon. Don't just drink lots of water, it needs sodium as much as water, if not more. Yes, this is an excellent point. This is why Gatorade and Pedialyte are so popular with people that are rolling. Um, excuse me, it helps you retain water. Excuse me. You're also sweating a lot usually. So making sure that you're getting salt intake is really important for that as well. That chart is stupid and I don't know why I have it. Okay, so some adulterants of MDMA. PMMA and PMA are what are called piperazines. And these have kind of died down in the last couple of years. They're not quite as common, um, but they're stimulants with antidepressant-like qualities, but they're unpredictable and in some cases have led to deaths, just unpredictable. Then there's N-ethylpentylone, which also unpredictably has led to deaths. It's a synthetic cathinone, which is a bath salt effectively, um, and we don't know very much about it. It was really on the rise in 2017 and has kind of dipped out a little bit again since then. But with COVID, a lot of these older adulterants are coming back on the market. So N-ethylpentylone is a really big one to look out for right now. Then there's 4-FA, or 4-FA. And I have a lot to say on this, but I'll wait until we actually talk about 4-FA later. 4-FA is a stimulant that's actually very popular in um, the Netherlands and has been for some time. We don't know very much about it, but 4-FA has the potential to, again, very unpredictably cause strokes and cerebral hemorrhages in some people. And some people have zero problem with it whatsoever, and it has fewer negative side effects than MDMA for them. So these are all examples of like really, oh girl, I want to hear everything. Yeah, I'll talk about 4-FA later, because um, that one is a little bit of a mess. And just in terms of like how people react to it, it's so all over the map. Then there's methylone, and methylone was, it used to be a very common adulterant of MDMA. Methylone is usually used to adulterate MDMA because it's very similar to how MDMA looks and smells and tastes and feels, but it's less empathogenic. It's less lovey dovey than MDMA. It's kind of like the little sister cousin of MDMA that just isn't quite as much as Molly is, and it's more um, speedy, it's more amphetamine. Then there's meth. It's meth. You know, like doing meth once in the form of a press pill. Honestly, I'm not going to lie to you. I bet that a lot of you here in the festival scene have probably done that and you're alive. Like doing meth once in the form of a press pill is not usually going to be the end of the world for people, but it might not be the experience that you're looking for. It's quite a lot more stimulating, obviously. It can be higher risk for a lot of reasons and higher concentrations and quantities. And it's not very empathogenic. It's very about me. And then there are miscellaneous adulterants. There are so many fucking things that can be in MDMA. Please never get cocky about knowing what's in your molly. Please don't do it. There are hundreds of different substances that could be in your bag or your pill or your crystal or your powder. Don't ever just like sniff test it or assume that it's good because of the source. Like I've personally witnessed people buy things from people that they've known for years and had it be PMMA. Like it just happens sometimes, even to the most experienced people. Caffeine, oh no. <laughs> Although if you're anything like me, getting like a cup of Earl Grey, like, ooh, man, that just gets you going. That's so stimulating. Sugar, honestly, might be one of the more toxic things here. Then there's MDA, which we'll come back to in greater detail later. Are there some adulterants that, can be that cannot be determined with test kits? Most of them, actually, unfortunately. Um, Ooh, okay, so I do want to talk about this conversation that's happening in the chat about test kits. So, and we're going to come back to this in greater detail when we do like a full spotlight on test kits, but I do want to talk about this now because it's very important to understand the limitations of these kits. If you are going to use a reagent kit, 
you need to understand. And if you look on the class website under the resources tab, there's a folder of some infographics that I've made for DanceSafe. And one of them is how to properly use test kits and their limitations. And you should all read it. Please read it. Um, if you're going to use a test kit, you need to understand a few things. The first is it is used as a presumptive and not an affirmative test. It's used not to tell you what something is, but if your substance is like definitely not what you want. So for instance, if you're using it to test MDMA and the, the typical reaction for MDMA is you need to use multiple reagents. You cannot just use Marquis. You cannot just use Marquis. I repeat, you can't just use Marquis. It's not enough. There's just not enough information. Um, you need to look for, on the Marquis reagent, it's a black, re black reaction, Meki is black reaction, Mendelin's black reaction, and then Simon's is a blue reaction. Even if all of those reactions turn out the way that you expect them to and they match with MDMA on the chart, that does not necessarily mean, oh, this substance is pure MDMA, good MDMA, only MDMA. Like, that's not necessarily what it means. All it means is that MDMA is the single most discernible component in your substance. So, this is very important to keep in mind because a lot of people will test it and then be like, oh, it's good. This is what it is. Hey, y'all. Thanks. Um, and the other thing about this is that the test kits have a very limited number of things that you can test for. And a lot of internet resources that tell you like what to look for on the kits are not actually that reliable. So what you're really looking for is like, oh, this substance really does not match this thing that I'm looking for, which means that it's probably mostly not what I'm looking for. Um, proceed with caution with all these things. There's another thing that I was gonna say that was very important. Oh yes, your, your test kit can only tell you the single, primary most detectable component in your sample. It cannot tell you if there are multiple things in the sample. I don't care what your reaction looks like. I work for the company that makes the kits. Please trust me on this. You cannot tell if your shit is like cut with multiple things. The only exception for this, lightly speaking, is if your cocaine is cut with amphetamine or levamisol, which is a cattle dewormer, which a lot of coke is cut with. So, um, Test kits also have a finite shelf life, so make sure to replace them. Yes, they only last for about a year to a year and a half, and you have to store them in a cool, dry place, preferably a fridge or freezer. We'll come back to this later. Um, a lot of the adulterants found in MDMA are just caffeine, honestly. Caffeine is, like, really, really commonly used as an adulterant because it just, like, has that stimulating feeling and can make you feel more capable. It actually is not a traditional stimulant, though. Caffeine acts on a neurotransmitter called adenosine, which is responsible for building up as the day goes on, it indicates that you're sleepy. If you drink caffeine, it prevents adenosine from building up, and your brain is tricked, basically. But you also can get terrible withdrawals and migraines like I do. Now let's talk about MDA. Oh my god, I'm <laughs> taking so long to do everything. So MDA is kind of a cousin of MDMA as well, and it's a lower dosage than MDMA. So if at times you've weighed out without testing some crystal and it's been like 80 milligrams you've taken it, you happen to be rolling a lot harder than you were expecting to and feeling like a lot more stimulated and like body sensations, it might've been MDA. So MDA is also known as SAS or sassafras because it is kind of closer to the original saffron derivative than MDMA is. It's like the unwashed version of MDMA, so to speak. And when you're on it, it's also known as rolling. But take a look at this, right? You can have MDMA in the form of, or sorry, MDA in the form of brown or deep purple or black. This is, I would say, what a lot of people look for when they're buying it, is that they want this deep purple, brown, black color. However, please note that MDMA can look just like this as well. It can. I seemed it. And then it can also look just like crystalline, white, powdered, chunky, rocky, whatever, MDMA. <laughs> you just can't tell them apart. It can also be in a press bill like MDMA. And they smell and taste and look identical in most cases. Kind of off topic, kind of not since we were, we were talking about MDMA, but just curious. A few months ago, a friend of mine told me she was taking acid tabs that were laced with meth and molly. Is that legit possible? No, that is completely impossible. You cannot lace a tab with meth and molly. Um, lacing implies that you have added those substances to a tab, and I'll tell you why that's not possible. 
meth and molly are active in high milligram doses. So a dose of MDMA in a capsule would take up about this much space. Now think about the size of an acid tab and the fact that if you're dropping liquid onto an acid tab, it's gonna be like a, a tenth of a grain of sand or a hundredth of a grain of sand or whatever it is in liquid. How the fuck are you supposed to fit a gel caps worth of crystal onto that piece of paper. You can't do it. You can't like liquefy MDMA like that unless it's like free base MDMA in pure oil form, in which case you got yourself a massive sticky like stamp. <laughs> like, oh no, what's up with this inch long tab with like multiple <laughs> layers of shit on it? <laughs> so that is not possible. What is possible, however, is that since it has to tap with meth and molly, like, mm, it, what is possible is that it was just not acid at all, and it was something like DOX or 25i Enbom or something that kind of feels like it combines the qualities of those things. Um, and the absolute worst case scenario is that your tab was like in a bag with meth and molly at the same time, which doesn't seem too likely to me, and it has trace amounts on the outside. Not enough to get you high. So... MDMA gets broken down into MDMA in your liver. And it's possible, but we're not sure about this, it's possible that MDA is a potentially more neurotoxic metabolite of MDMA. So when we dose supplements, and if you're curious, I have an entire list of supplements and when to dose them to be as safe as possible when you're rolling. Um, a lot of these supplements are actually intended to prevent the breakdown of MDMA into MDA for as long as possible. So. I lost my train of thought, my roommate's in the next room. Okay, so quick comparison of these two drugs. So MDMA is known for being more empathogenic, you're more interested in what other people have to say, you're more sociable with them, it's more emotionally available, it's more interpersonal, whereas MDA is known as being a little bit more chemically, a little bit more metallic, a, little, a lot more psychedelic in a lot of cases. Most people don't get any kind of visuals on MDMA. So if you're rolling and you have strong visuals, it might be MDA. Um, and it's considered by a lot of people to be more like, I have love for myself as opposed to I have love for others. Hey, Jack. Can't focus. So looking at the safety profile of this, ecstasy is rated like near the bottom here. And there's a reason for it. It just does not have a very high likelihood of inducing in terms of psychological negative effects, like it's quite rare for MDMA to induce negative psychological effects acutely because when you're rolling, you feel good as hell. <laughs> it's really hard to have a bad time when you're rolling. Really hard. Because <laughs> everything just feels right with the world. Unless you're underdosed and that shit sucks. Um, it does have more complications possible than traditional psychedelics like LSD or mushrooms, but it is still considered to be a very low risk substance compared to a lot of other drugs, honestly. This being said, if you take a sufficient quantity of it, it could absolutely raise your heart rate and blood pressure, cause you to have some kind of cardiac arrest that happens sometimes with MDMA as people's body temperature goes up really high or their blood pressure spikes and that sends them into cardiac arrest. And that's a huge complication that we see. So dosing adequately is still really important here. Now, let's talk harm reduction, okay? If you have the opportunity to, buy crystals instead of pills or powder. Again, only the chemist can cut the rock and make sure that you test the rock. If you have multiple little rocks, if you really wanna know what each of them is, you're gonna to have to test them separately. If you have a single rock that was scraped off the tray from Germany, how the fuck you got that, then that's a lot easier because you can just nail file a little bit of it off and test it and most likely that rock is going to be all whatever that thing is. So try to do that when possible. T press pills are the least safe of all of them. Don't over drink water. Like don't drink like a gallon of water to the point where you feel sick. That'll flush your system and thin your blood. But make sure that you stay hydrated and you probably won't have too difficult of a time staying hydrated while you're rolling because bitch is going to be thirsty. Heat stroke. Heating is the number one issue. You think press pills are less safe than powder. I do. I really do, actually. Um, they have their own sets of problems, for sure. But I would say that with pressies, you just have, like, no concept. Like, you can't even tell what color a powder is. And at least if you have, like, a bag of black powder, you can be like, okay, that's probably not MDMA. And if it is, it's probably really shit quality. Um, 
the issue with pressies is that they have binders in them to the point where you like you just can't I, I just think that pressies are the most sus oh actually no 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 my, my reasoning for this is more specific it's that with pressies you have no idea how much is in them period with powder at least you can weigh it and even if there are bulkers or adulterants in it at, at least you're not going to take like way more than you're intending to because if it's cut then it'll have just less MDMA in it than you're expecting. But with a press pill, it could easily have 300 milligrams in it, and you could have no idea. There's no way to know without face checking it. Um, heating is the number one issue. Heat stroke, very dangerous. Um, space out your rolls. Okay, let's talk about this now. So spacing rolls is like my gospel. <laughs> I'm so into this topic. But before I say anything, I have to also give a counterexample out of fairness. Anne Shulgin, the wife of Sasha Shulgin, one of the most renowned drug research of, of all history, basically. I'm so busy. Jack! Are you yelling my name? Yeah. Would you mind being on the phone in the other room for a few minutes? Yeah. Thanks. Okay. So um, here's, here's my sentiment on this. Anne Shulgin, wife of Sasha Shulgin, very renowned MDMA researcher. Um, Powders can be cut too, methylene resembles MDMA. Well, yes, of course. I'm not saying the powders can't be cut. Powders are pretty much always cut as well. Um, crystals are the safest. Chunky crystals in bag are the second safest. I would say that powders are the third safest and press pills are the least safe because of the issue of quantity and cutting and all that stuff. Um, just try and get crystal. That's really all I have to say on that one, if you can get crystal. Right, and Shogun. She rolled every weekend for, what, a, a decade or more? And it was fine. She would use it as a creative writing aid. She was not rolling in large quantities, but she was rolling every weekend. However, and like, I feel the need to throw that in here because like at the end of the day, people do have different bodies that respond differently to different drugs. Some people can do that. I say, generally speaking, and through massive amounts of anecdotal evidence, if you roll more than once every or four to six months approximately, you have like a couple of years where you can get away with that. And then after a couple of years, it's gonna start declining in quality for you, like guaranteed, it's just going to. The nature of your roles will change. You will start thinking more about the come down. You will start being more aware of your own anxiety. You will need more to roll successfully. The role will become less intense, less empathogenic. And generally speaking, people in the rave scene in particular that engage in this practice of rolling more than two or three times a year have like a max of five years, maybe six or seven if they're lucky, where they can get away with it until rolling just stops working, often forever. And I guess my point here is that this is a remarkable substance that can be used for incredibly therapeutic purposes. You do not want to be in your 40s and not be able to take advantage of this to save your marriage or to heal PTSD. Like, that's really where I stand on this. I do think that two to three months is like a minimum time frame. If you roll two nights in a row, as Shark said, um, you should wait a long time, in my opinion. And some people find that they don't need to be quite that stringent. Oh no, I'm almost out of time. Some people find that they don't need to be quite that stringent about this, but I really, really, really suggest that you just take this seriously. Don't roll them more than two or three times a year. Don't play roulette with this if you're a person that rolls because rolling too often, like you're, you are putting yourself at risk for basically your body being like, I know what you're doing. Like I anticipate what's happening and like, <laughs> like clamming up and being like, no, 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 I'm not giving you all my serotonin again. I know what happened last time. You can't catch me. So be careful. Um, start logo slow, dose properly. You don't need typically more than 125 milligrams to roll unless you've been rolling too frequently, in which case you might need like 250. And if you're at that point, then you've probably pushed it too far. Um, scared straight. <laughs> now, I do want to reinforce here that people have different bodies. The reason, again, that I say this is that I just think that it's not worth the risk of not being able to roll anymore if it's something that's important to you. So that's, that's really why I make that recommendation is like, I know so many people who rolled once a month, even once every two months for like three, four years, and then they had to take like years off and rolling still isn't the same for them. I just know so many people that that's happened to. 
and it's sad for them, you know, because it's like you roll between the ages of like 17 and 21, and then that's it. And maybe like after five or six years, you can do it again, but it just doesn't feel quite the same way. Um, make sure that you're looking up all of your interactions and checking your medications or other indulgences. And with the SSRI thing, we're going to come back to that. We're like out of time right now. Another rule of thumb for dosage is body weight in kilograms divided by two plus 90 is suggested dosage in milligrams. I can't do math. I'll look at that later. Um, since we're over time, I'm going to stop here and we will talk about preloading and postloading and supplements and 5-HTP, which really grinds my gears. Um, but also, I know that there were more questions that we had. If you want to email them to me, I'll answer them in email because there were a lot of really good questions. And I know there's a lot to say about MDMA. Um, thank you so much, guys. And I will see you on Thursday. We'll finish this up and start talking about stimulants. And Sharky, you could stop recording. Thanks. Cool. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Have a good night.